Welcome to Moments with Mary Ann. I'm so delighted we're spending this time here today. We have a very inspiring show coming right up with two very special guests. Our first guest today is E.R. Ramsapur, who's here to share with us her new novel, The Ventriloquist. Now, E.R. is a writer based in California, and she's worked as a content marketer writing about cybercrime and online fraud. She studied political science at UC Berkeley, where she researched underground literature in resistance movements and discovered the lost story that we're about to hear. So let's welcome to the show, E.R. Ramsapur. Thanks so much for having me. You know, what a joy it is to have you here and to talk about your new book. I mean, it's getting great reviews. I'm sure you're excited as an author about that. Oh, yes. I'm I'm really excited. You never know when you release a piece of fiction like this, especially one that's a little bit different, how it's going to be received. And I'm really excited at the response. Well, and it's such a timely read as well, because it deals with a lot of things that we kind of find ourselves dealing with today. Yeah, it really does. You know, a couple of outlets have called it the first novel of fake news. And I'm not sure that's quite true. But it is one of the first novels of fake news, I think, in this new era where fake content is a buzzword or buzz phrase of the day. Um, And it's interesting because I didn't necessarily set out to write that, but it kind of became more and more relevant as I was in the process of writing it. And what I'm hoping readers will get out of it is a a more complicated and maybe more nuanced um, idea of what propaganda is and the line between reality and propaganda um, and the meaning of truth. And I think the the ventriloquist is a really interesting exploration of that. I would agree with you. It's so very well written. And I love how you bring everything together in the way that you have. You know, so why don't you share with us, like, what inspired you to write this book and to follow the thread of this part in history? Yeah, absolutely. So I kind of stumbled across this story accidentally. I was doing some research for a paper that I was writing about underground media and secret newspapers. And I came across this document that was written by five women at the US War Office after World War II. And it mentioned how various resistance groups in Europe used underground literature to survive Nazi occupation. And there was just this this line that was quite short. um, And it talked about in this very matter of fact way how this, these ragtag members of the Belgian underground printed tens of thousands of copies of a secret newspaper that made fun of the Nazis in just 18 days. So I read this and I, I was just blown away by that. I'd never heard anything like that before. And I mean, I, I've sat through the same history classes as most of, our, most of your listeners, I think, and read the same books, you know, and seen the same movies. And this picture of resistance was fundamentally incompatible with the one in my head and the one that I, I'd learned about before. Because instead of, you know, men with guns on the battlefield storming the beaches, we had this group of everyday heroes who resisted by, by pulling a prank on the Nazis and a very high stakes prank. Um, and I started to imagine who these people must have been and what could have motivated them to risk their lives for a joke. And I was so touched and stunned by the story that I had to learn more. How long did it take you to do your research for this book? The research was kind of an interesting process because um, for one, you know, like I said, the book takes place on this very tight timeline, just 18 days. So these real life figures didn't have a lot of time to kind of sit down and document exactly what they were doing. Uh, And it also would have been very dangerous for them to do so because they were operating in secret. So there isn't a ton of information out there about these real life heroes. And I had to, I I did spend some time, a few months uh, doing some digging to kind of learn more about the Belgian underground itself to kind of get an idea of the texture and the feel of the city at the time and what the physical footprint of the Nazi occupation would have looked like. Um, But in terms of researching these real life people, it was very difficult to do and there wasn't a lot out there. When you started going into the research and learning about these real people and and developing your storyline where they become some of the central characters, who was your favorite? That's a fun question. Who was my favorite? 
I have a couple of favorites, I think. If I could pick two, I, I, it's kind of a toss-up. Um, for one, we I have this character, David Spiegelman, who's kind of, uh, I think, the soul of the story. He's, he's a literary ventriloquist, I call him, uh, meaning he can write in the voice of anyone from his mother to Winston Churchill. And he's this fascinating character who was pressed into service for the Nazis um, and, and forced to work for them as, and, and use his gifts as a literary ventriloquist. But of course, he's drawn to the resistance and he wants to help our heroes create this underground newspaper. So he's sort of trapped between these two wor worlds um, and he's very troubled as well because he, so he's a, he's a gay man and, you know, during a time when obviously the world was not exactly friendly to um, LGBT people. And just his journey of um, self-discovery and redemption and finding his own voice um, was just so fun to write. And he's not a real life character. He's one of the few um, characters in this novel who is not real, but he is based on real life characters who would have been forced to use their, their talents and their gifts for the Nazis. Um, I also, I loved writing Mark Aubryon. Mark Aubryon is the main architect of this scheme, and he was a real person. He was a minor journalist at a resistance newspaper, and he certainly would not have been a household name at the time by any stretch of the imagination. He was just an ordinary guy, really, who, who happened to be a writer. And he was the one who came up with this idea to create this fake newspaper that would come out on Armistice Day and that would commemorate the German defeat in World War I. And I, I found a few primary source documents that describe him as this very brilliant but kind of scatterbrained guy um, who wrote the newspaper in this excited fury. So it was just interesting to really get into the head of this man who really was the one who decided, yes, we are going to put our lives on the line for a joke. That's pretty brave, especially during that period in history, because if the Nazis got a hold of him and found out he had done that, it could have been a whole different story. Exactly. Yeah. Was there anything about Mark that you discovered that kind of surprised you? Um, what was it that surprised me? That's a good question. I think I was surprised just by the fact that he was nobody famous, nobody in particular. I think like most people, um, before I wrote this book, I thought about these acts of heroism um, under occupation as feats that were performed by organized groups, like organized resistance movements or secret armies, you know, underground armies. I, I never thought that it could be possible for just a guy to say, you know what, I think I'm going to try to put out tens of thousands of copies of a fake newspaper, and he could actually pull it off. He was associated with the resistance, so he did have some help. But at the end of the day, these people were, were just like you and me, and he was just like you and me. But the stuff that he was able to pull off was so uh, over the top that it actually made it difficult for me to um, get this book sold initially because some agents and editors who I'd pitched the book to said there's no way an ordinary person could have done this when indeed there's documents that show that these are exactly the things that he was able to do. Just to give an example, not to give too much away, um, there's a subplot in which to kind of create a distraction, Aubryon decides that he's going to persuade the Royal Air Force to bomb Belgium, which just seems so outlandish. Like, how could an ordinary person possibly do that? And yet he did. He actually succeeded in doing that. That, I know that part of the story was very unreal. I mean, you're reading this going, I can't believe this is happening. I know. And that's how I felt when I discovered it. I was like, there's no way this could have happened. But it, it absolutely did. It's easy to see why there are lots of questions, you know, because he is an ordinary guy, you know, just kind of, you know, doing some very extraordinary things. Yeah, absolutely. And I imagine he was probably somewhat of an eccentric guy as well, because you'd have to be to, to even think of this. But at the end of the day, you know, he was he was nobody in particular. And I think that makes this story really beautiful. Yeah, I love how you have the, the Nazi um, 
soldier who's the main protagonist, he's really multidimensional, which was a little surprising because a lot of times you just kind of think, oh, that's just the bad guy. Right. Yeah. And, and that was something that I did very intentionally because I think when you're setting out to write a Nazi, it's so easy to just fall into the familiar trope. I mean, Nazi has just become synonymous with evil as, as it should, of course. Um, and it's the idea of writing a three dimensional Nazi character was a little bit difficult, but it was important for me to write this antagonist August Wolf as a sort of three dimensional guy um, because as I was reading accounts of what drew people into Nazism, it became very clear that nobody set out one day to, to just become evil, to go do evil deeds. For, for many people, um, it was this very slow descent into evil that took the form of very banal acts of, of terror and I, I wanted to create a character who is clearly torn in, in the novel. Um, Wolf admires Aubryon and he admires his ability to use his gifts to create something as beautiful and, and hilarious as this newspaper, but he's also very ambitious and he's bound to the Nazi ideology and his quest for sort of perfection. Um, so I think he, that makes him a, an interesting foil to Aubryon and it kind of illuminates, I think, this idea of uh, the banality uh, of evil. Well, you did so well bringing, you know, this antagonist together in this story. I mean, it's, it's written very, very well. It's just real, you know, once I started reading your book, I couldn't put it down. <laughs> but oh, I'm thank you. That from a lot of people, you know, and it's, I would love for you to share with our listeners, like, why did you choose the title that you did for your book? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think the title works on a couple of different levels. For one, this is a story about people who are writing in the voice uh, of this newspaper. So the newspaper that they set out to create is a parody of a Nazi propaganda paper called Le Soir. At the time, it was Nazi propaganda. The paper still exists today. Um, it is no longer Nazi propaganda. Um, so these characters were writing in the voice and the style of Le Soir, but putting their own humorous spin on it. I actually have a couple of copies of the newspaper myself, the original 1943 copies of this fake newspaper. And at first, when you open it up and start reading it, it's easy to think, oh, this is just a, a run-of-the-mill Nazi propaganda newspaper. You know, it's written in that very, like, puffed-up purple style um, that the Nazis used to describe how, how great they were. But as you sort of start to read more closely, it becomes clear that, you know, these are puns, these are parodies, these are jokes, and it's amazing. So that's, that's one level of the title. The title also refers to something else, which is that, you know, Europe at the time under Nazi occupation had become uh, very hostile to freedom of expression it was impossible for people who'd made their living as artists and writers and thinkers to do that once the Nazis occupied Belgium or, or wherever. And so the story is also about how all of these individual characters have to kind of get back in touch with their voice and, and, and find their voices in order to return uh, the voice to the people of Belgium. So it's kind of these two parallel tracks. Well, I'm so glad you brought that all together because it's uh, very interesting. And gosh, you know, how how fascinating it must have been to be able to get your hands on the paper back then. Yeah, I was really surprised. I kind of looked it up on eBay on a whim to see if I could find anything. Um, and for the most part, people have sort of forgotten about this story. I know some people in Belgium do know about it, but it's certainly not widely known. And so I was able to get a couple of copies for uh, just, a, you know, like 12 euros, um, which is amazing and, and extraordinary. And I, I really hope the value of the paper starts to go up as people see um, just how extraordinary this is. Oh, I can imagine it just went up in value. So. <laughs> I may have shot myself in the foot. <laughs> well, and so, you know, we're not going to go into the whole book because we want people to pick up their own copy of the ventriloquist and have that. But what do you want readers and our listeners to take away from your book? Yeah, I think the main thing I want them to take away is 
Um, just a more nuanced picture of what resistance looked like during World War II. Um, like I said, I had no idea before I started researching for this story and discovered um, the story of, of Le Soir that uh, resistance ever looked like this. In my head, it was just these, just men with guns. Um, but in many cases, you know, there were women and children who who were involved. One of the one of the characters in the book, um, who is a real life person, is a female judge who was known as sort of this puppet master who was able to manipulate Nazi bureaucracy to get things done. And she was the one who ended up raising money for them to pull off this amazing scheme. Another character is a child. A couple of the characters are queer. One of them is disabled. So I, I was really excited to tell this story because these architects of resistance are who we would traditionally consider to be the oppressed during World War II. Um, and instead of showing them suffering at the hands of their oppressors, they get to be the masters of their own stories. Do you feel that people who are in the resistance now feel kind of the same way? I think so. Yeah, I really think so. And I'm hoping that, you know, today's resist resistors will look to this for inspiration because I think for many of us who are of a certain uh, political <laughs> inclination, um, it's, it's easy to feel very small right now and very helpless. Um, and like, there's nothing that we can possibly do to make a change because all of these institutions and all these people in power are, are, are just so great and so big. Um, and, and that's, that's basically what these people were up against in the ventriloquist. They were up against this huge larger than life threat. And yet they were able to make an impact, however small. Um, and again, these were just ordinary people who were able to use their voices, uh, for, for something beautiful and good. So where can our listeners learn more about your book and connect with you and be part of your community? So you can find me basically on, on all social media, Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. I'm E.R. Ramsapore. That's E.R. Ramsapore with an M, R-A-M-Z-I-P-O-O-R. Um, and you can also find me at erramsapore.com. Well, E.R., thank you so much for taking the time to be on the show with us here today. Oh, thank you so much for having me. It was a pleasure. Well, thank you, ER. It's been such an honor to spend this time with you and, of course, to talk about your new book, The Ventriloquist. We are going to pause here for a quick break. You've been listening to Moments with Marianne. We'll be right back after these messages. Internationally recognized and award-winning author Judy Goodman works and teaches outside the box of limited thinking. Working with people from every walk of life, her goal is to empower you to be the best you can be, no matter what the challenge is. Born with the gift of seeing beyond our normal vision, she has an extraordinary gift of working with every challenge. Teaching beyond conventional wisdom, her work is described as life-changing. Visit JudyGoodman.com. That's JudyGoodman.com. There comes a moment when you realize you're somewhere special, when you discover that each beautiful creature that you see has been rescued from a life of absolute horror and brought to this incredibly free place. Here's where their lives were forever changed and where yours will as well. Discover over 500 tigers, bears, and lions at the brand new visitor center at the Wild Animal Sanctuary just outside Denver. For more information, visit wildanimalsanctuary.org. Discover true freedom at the Wild Animal Sanctuary. There are nearly 2 million Americans living with amputation. Many live right here in San Antonio. Becoming an amputee can be scary, frustrating, isolating, but there's no reason to feel alone. The San Antonio Amputee Foundation is here to help support you and guide you toward resources such as home and car modifications and even prosthetic limbs. For more information or to make a donation, visit saamputee.org. We'll help you live a full, active life, one step at a time. San Antonio Amputee Foundation, healing limbs, hearts, and and souls. 
If not me, then who? This ethos is driving the Travis Manion Foundation to empower veterans and families of fallen heroes to develop character in future generations. In 2007, Marine First Lieutenant Travis Manion was killed in Iraq while saving his wounded teammates. Travis's legacy lives on in the five words he spoke before leaving for his final deployment. If not me, then who? Guided by this mantra, veterans continue their service, developing strong relationships in the community and thrive in their post-military lives. Visit TravisManion.org and ensure the character of our nation's heroes lives on in the next generation. If not me, then who? Welcome back to Moments with Marianne. We're here today with our next special guest, Carla Samoth, and she's here to share with us her new book, One Day on the Gold Line, a memoir in essays. Now, Carla has taught creative writing to incarcerated youth through Write Girl and teaches at the Los Angeles Writing Project at California State University, Los Angeles, and Southern New Hampshire University. Her writings have appeared in various publications, including Brain, Child, Long Reads, The Nervous Breakdown, and much more. Carla has an MFA from Queens University in Charlotte, and she's a member of the Pasadena Rose Poets. So let's welcome to the show, Carla Samoth. Thank you. So happy to be here. Yeah, what a joy it is to have you here and to talk about your new book. I have to ask, like, what inspired you to write this book? Well, you might say that I wrote the book that I really wanted to read. Um, I wanted to see a book that reflected our family. Um, And um, I also was struggling with a lot of different issues around first trying to have a child, multiple miscarriage, um, issues around race and identity, um, police violence, um, and ultimately my teenage son struggled with addiction. And I wanted to see um, a family that didn't look like Norman Rockwell's. <laughs> and so uh, I, during different times of crisis in my life, reading other people's stories that had some connection to mine was a real lifeline. Um, and I, I began to read different pieces. Um, my book is a memoir and essay essays and they're linked to essays that form a story arc. So they read as a whole. It's not an essay collection. But as I began to publish individual essays, I had people come up to me and say, you know, this happened to me or this made me feel less alone. Um, and, and I really, I wanted to provide that connection, the same connection that I looked for as a reader. So I know the journey started with a boat. Why don't you share with us how that all came to be? Yes, uh, I was on a lifeboat in the middle of the Mediterranean, and everyone on that boat uh, was crying on the lifeboat. It was like the movies. I'd I'd gone away after breaking up, uh, a relationship breaking up, having to terminate a pregnancy because of medical risks. So I got on a boat from Italy to Greece, and I was going to go and try to recoup some of my strength. And I was on the boat sleeping peacefully when I was woken up by really loud uh, uh, talking in in Greek. (laughs) And then I heard, get up, get up. And I went out onto the deck that when I went to sleep, it was just idyllic, you know, women, children, uh, men and dogs stretched across the deck. And it looked, it was a beautiful scene. And in the, when they woke me up in the wee hours of the morning, it was, um, it was actually the middle of the night because it was still dark. Um, there was complete chaos. It looked like they had never lowered a light boat in their lives. And um, it was like the movies. It was women, children, and dogs on the lifeboats, and the men stayed on the ship. And everyone was pretty much feeling that they were crying and crossing themselves. This was it. I was thinking, you know, it's been a pretty good life. I think I was about 30 years old and sort of resigned. You know, I'm ready to go. And then I looked over and saw the one other person not crying, who was a mother with her baby, rocking her baby. Their eyes were just locked. And I began to cry. And I realized that if I were to die right then, my biggest regret would be never having had a child. Um, So my memoir is actually about my difficult journey to having a son. And, And the myths I believed about how easy it might be to create that family for that family to be safe sanctuary. Because I thought that my son having a lesbian mom, being African American and Jewish, being part of a blended family, or even with a single mom would make just make his life richer. 
But in fact, it was much, much harder. Um, and so my memoir talks about navigating life's challenges, um, as I said, including race and identity, police violence, and ultimately, as a teenager, my son's struggle with addiction. So you you talk about, in your book, you talk about going through the whole process of, you know, becoming pregnant. Why don't you share some of that with our listeners? Right. So I um, I was always thinking that when it was time for me to have a child, I would kind of check in and be ready and I'd have some, a partner and uh, or be married. And, um, but around the time that I really, after being on this boat and I came back and I really wanted to have a child and I was prepared to have a child on my own. Um, my parents seemed supportive. My family seemed to back me up. But when I really started to say, okay, I'm going to do this, they began to really want to see me doing it with someone else. <laughs> and so they even put an ad in the Jewish journal for me. Um, oh, no. <laughs> uh, but I did end up um, meeting someone who had had a crush on me when I'd left to, um, I'd, I'd left to go to another city to marry someone else and ran into that person. And pretty soon um, he was talking about how he felt like it was later in his life for his community to be having a child and really wanted to have a child. And so he, you know, he gave me the most romantic line, want to have a, my, my baby, <laughs> uh, not quite like that, but um, we, we, we began trying to have a child and I, um, before we even fell in love and got married, I'd already miscarried several times. Um, I had multiple miscarriages and ended up having all kinds of invasive treatment um, for recurrent miscarriage that they attributed to um, immunological issues. And, you know, if you asked me this 20 years ago, I could rattle off all the the science of it. Um, But it was a lot of invasive treatment that added up in cost. And about the time that I was ready to give up, um, I mean, it had a huge toll on me physically and my, my, health was not that good at that point. I was ready to give up and leave the marriage, which was not going well, and go out and try to adopt a child on my own once I recouped financially and health-wise. But I ended up being pregnant with my son, um, and that pregnancy did was successful, ultimately. Um, but I, I've been pregnant many times, um, about eight times in total, uh, with one, one son, um, so it was so much harder than I thought that it would be. Um, and um, yeah, just, just the act of being able to give birth. So by the time I had my son, I was really so ecstatic about being able to have a baby. And I would say that it gave me a lot more patience in those early years. Uh, a lot of moms will talk about in the early years of uh, when, when their baby is an infant feeling really frustrated, you know, maybe the baby has colic, but I think I had an extraordinary amount of patience in those early years, at least because I'd waited so long and been through so much. And he was so eagerly expected by, by my family and community. What a journey that was, especially when you have your someone going through high risk pregnancy. I mean, it must've been very stressful during that time, even though, you know, it's so rewarding at the end. It was really stressful. And, you know, um, I, my HMO wasn't particularly good about coming up with a uh, treatment for recurrent miscarriage. It just kind of seemed to feel like keep having one and maybe you'll get lucky. And so I was seeing outside doctors, like a reproductive immunologist, um, when this pregnancy did seem that it was going to be successful, as they say, and the, that I was going to, you know, baby was going to go to term, I got more support from the outside doctor. This, they, they, kind of comped what we were going to have to pay extraordinary amounts with the Chicago Medical School. At the same time, um, at my HMO at Kaiser, we um, we were in the high-risk pregnancy unit. And that meant that I, um, yeah, I was constantly, I, I was on a strict gestational diabetic diet, um, which developed because I needed to take prednisone, um, due to the miscarriages. And before I knew I, I um, had gestational diabetes, <laughs> I was really in, wanted to enjoy being pregnant. And I, um, 
we, we, I was ordering ice cream to be delivered. <laughs> I had to quickly cut that one out. Um, but I had someone who called from the high risk pregnancy every, um, every week to check on me. And, um, she, she'd ask, you know, are you, are you having any contractions and, you know, a strict, very strict regimen in terms of rest and no sex. And so one time she called and I, you know, and I said, well, it was second trimester, which, for a lot of women is a time when you relax and you feel very sexual. And <laughs> she called and I said, well, I'm having dreams. And she said, okay, we can't control your dreams. Um, but um, it, it was very scary. Um, I think that I kind of relaxed into the pregnancy later on um, as I got, you know, as I got closer to term um, and I actually went full term. They thought that I would probably go into labor uh, maybe a month early, but um, I went full term and he was born. He was very healthy when he was born, although it was an emergency C-section uh, because the cord was wrapped around his neck and that was really, really frightening. But um, as it turns out, he was fine. Yeah, I can only imagine. I mean, going full term and having to do an emergency C section and being high risk during the entire pregnancy, you know, it, it just sounds like it was such a stressful time. And then you have this beautiful boy arrive. And what was it like for you and your family? You know, those early, that early time, I have a friend that calls it mommy time when, you know, everything sort of slows down. Um, you, you know, you're living utterly in the present with a new baby. And, you know, so it was really quite lovely because um, I, I think it was one of my sisters who said that during that awful time when I was having all the miscarriages and my marriage was very troubled, that, my, you know, my face kind of looked, always looked almost like a, a war victim. <laughs> um, and I, when this little boy came into the world, this little baby, it was really a joyous time. And, um, you know, I say that the mommy time, you're living really in the moment. It, it's one of the wonderful things about babies, you know, they might be crying and upset, and they go to sleep, and they wake up, and it's a whole new day, unlike uh, us as adults, where we sometimes carry our worries and our anger and our resentments into the next day, week, year, <laughs> they sort of wake up and start fresh. So it really was a wonderful time for all of us. Um, and uh, yeah, it, it was pretty life changing. And I, um, I felt really strongly that how, that I did the right thing. And, you know, there were many times where I, I questioned like how people probably looked at me like, how hard is she willing to try to have a baby? Uh, and, and I had gotten to the point where I was going to stop and adopt because ultimately I wanted to raise a child. And, but I really feel felt and feel that it was well worth all the effort. Now, let me just say that there's a lot of people that struggle with infertility, with recurrent miscarriage, and they end up without the baby and without the, the relationship. And I kind of was afraid that's what was going to happen to me. I had this image of ending up without a child, broke, alone, some kind of weird disease, because there were so many different treatments that I had for the miscarriage, including um, uh, IVIG, where you get a transfusion of a mixed blood product. And I just pictured having some weird disease, you know, and the doctor was treating me long dead, who was kind of like a mad scientist, Dr. Beer, um, the reproductive immunologist from Chicago Medical School. And so, you know, and I even started at the time, I started writing a short story about um, a woman who had become homeless and I was kind of going into her backstory. I was sort of writing out what, what I was afraid could eventually happen to me, you know, and uh, I still have never finished that story. I went back to it a few times. Um, but yeah, it was, it was a really difficult time and it was really a joyous time after I had my son. You talk about in your book, the, just the complications of identity and community and the challenges of a blended family. Why don't you dive into that for our listeners? So I always imagined, you know, I'm always a person that loves being surrounded by friends, family, community, kind of happy chaos. And as I said before, I thought that the fact that my son had a lesbian mom and he was African American Jewish and part of a blended family, even a single mom would make life richer for him. But it actually was 
over time much harder, the whole blended family than I had anticipated. I separated from my son's dad when he was eight months old. And I was a single mom till he was about seven when I met a woman who had a child the same age, four months younger than my son. And it just seemed like it was meant to be. Uh, the kids got along wonderfully. My stepdaughter immediately started calling me mom. And it, it had always felt like my son and I should be part of a bigger unit. You know, this um, couple kids, couple dogs. We, we had a gecko named Michael Jordan. <laughs> and, you know, just sort of pictured, you know, this, this bigger family. And it started out really well. And then there were, was a lot of tension. Um, my wife, uh, Lizette, in the book at the time, um, was experiencing a lot of anger towards men, which was reflected in how she treated my son, a, a young boy. And she, they went from getting along really well to her beginning to lash out at him on a regular basis, which created huge problems. And at the same time, my son was experiencing in his school, he was really excited when I met someone and he couldn't wait to tell everybody because I hadn't been, I had separated from his dad at eight months. So he had never seen me with anyone else. I had told him that explained about women loving women and men loving men. And he was, that idea was very, felt very natural to him that you could fall in love with someone of the same sex or, or, um, or with someone of the opposite sex, but he said it didn't really count. I wasn't really gay till I had a girlfriend or a wife. And he was so excited about the idea of having two mothers and a sister and he couldn't wait. He went into school and wanted to tell everybody about it. Um, but um, he, he began to be kind of shut down. It was during, it, kind of, it, it mirrored that of what was going on in the nation, his experience. Um, it was during the time of the kind of culture where it wars, the, anti-gay marriage movement. And so he was told at school, you know, that's fine. Don't bring that stuff to school, meaning talking about having another mother. At his school, we tried to show a film, That's a Family, which was a sweet film that showed single parent, biracial, adopted family, uh, lesbian family. And they pulled it because they, they felt that it would alienate some families. And this was from supposedly a liberal progressive school. Uh, at the same time, he was trying to come to terms with on identity issues and was told, oh, you're not really black, look in the mirror. And I think at that point, my son began to wish for a more conventional, like straight African-American intact middle-class family, like what we thought the Cosbys were, right? Um, <laughs> Yeah, and and this began, but things began to change as we know. Th the thinking in the nation began to change by the t when he got to middle school, high school. Um, he had a in middle school the last year he had a much more multiracial group of friends. The Arabic student gave the Jewish kids a Valentine that said "I love Jew," and by high school. Um, he was back to being okay with me being gay, saying, it's cool, mom. Who wouldn't want a lesbian mom? We can look at girls together. Um, and he would post things on his Facebook, like, you know, if you're a homophobe, come out and say you are. Put an H on your forehead. Um, and things became much more acceptable. Um, he also, when he was 13, um, he had a bar mitzvah, which was, um, at that point, we had, we were in the middle of the recession. Um, our blended family had unblended. Um, and he had this beautiful experience where there was a whole congregation of um, a large, uh, with, with um, his black and Latino friends. Um, and he read poetry, which was later translated into Spanish because somebody, a uh, reporter was there who wrote um, a story that this was the real LA um, he had to do a por Torah portion that was pretty bizarre. What do you What do you do when your wife is unfaithful? It was something like throw her in the water, and if she drowns, she's innocent, <laughs> and if she comes up, she's guilty. But somehow, with the rabbi, they distilled it to trust and vulnerability. And he wrote a sermon about Bernie Madoff and teen prostitutes, um, and read his poetry. And so I think at that point, I bring this up because for that window of time, I thought, you know, he's going to be okay. He seemed very proud in who he was, an Afro-Jew, um, and, you know, very proud in, in what he could do, you know, in terms of being able to give this 
teaching this speech to a large group of his peers and to be able to read his poetry and such. But um, the putting the families together was much more difficult. I mean, now I was really arrogant in the beginning. I sort of thought, you know, you know, we're just so great. This is so easy. Why do people say that blended families are hard? Um, we took a picture early on in when we were all together. Our, he was going to, for a little while, to a small private school, and they wanted to show that the, their community was more diverse than it looked like, so they wanted family pictures. And ours really fulfilled that because we took a picture of um, my, uh, the person I was married to, Lizette, and my stepdaughter, um, her Latino and my son and my son's dad, who's African American, in front of the Jackie and Mac sculptures in Pasadena, and so we just looked like the kind of we are the world family. Um, but yes, it, there there was so much more. It, it was much more complex than I thought it would be. Um, in in terms of creating a family and having safety um, and keeping that family intact. Well, you you mentioned that your son also had gone through a drug addiction. That must have been just heartbreaking having to go through that. It really was. Um, You know, when my son was little, I worried about things like lead poisoning. And for some I was really obsessed with lead. (laughs) Like if you start researching old homes, you you discover that more people should worry about it than than they do. But, um, and I remember my sister told me, why don't you worry about something more manageable, like organic vegetables. But I didn't think, oh, my son could grow up and become a drug addict. Maybe I should have because he he was sort of a nurseaholic. I used to say he had to go to NA to Nursing Anonymous because um, he would have nursed till he was in high school. If, I don't know about that. <laughs> um, but seriously, yes, he got to high school and he started experimenting with drugs and quickly went from being something not social to more something um, that was about him trying to obliterate feelings that he had that were troubling of anxiety of not school was difficult. He he was a dreamy intellectual, very smart, very verbal. But I, I think I've heard it said that for many, for many boys and young men, school can be like a 12 year prison sentence. Um, and so he really wanted to escape and he began ex- just experimenting with different drugs um, and at a certain point um, trying to take uh, drugs that could really shut down all that anxiety. Um, And that included getting a hold of large number, large amount of Robitussin tablets, taking 80, a hundred at a pop. So my life began um, pretty soon. I went down the rabbit hole of addiction and it began to be, a series of going to different inpatient and outpatient um, drug uh, treatment programs and in and out of 72 out 5150 holds for, for people who might be a danger to themselves, which they felt. And I could see his escalating drug use definitely put him at risk for death. Um, And it it was just a horrible time. I, I was, felt very powerless. I acted pretty crazy. I think it's really, I think it'll be useful for people to read the book um, and see just, um, it's not just the person who's addicted, who's struggling with the drugs, who, who might act crazy, um, but the family and the, the, friend, the people who are close to that person look even crazier. Um, and I about went out of my mind. Um, and, and I was very angry for a per- at different times because I, I just wanted him to stop and I couldn't understand like how, how could he lie or steal from, I sounded like, how could you do this? I'm a struggling single mom. And so for me, it was very helpful to read um, books by families um, of addicts and by the addicts himself and begin to understand, go to Al-Anon and begin to understand this is a disease that my son is a beautiful um insightful person. Um, and this is the disease that's acting, not my son. And so I was able to have develop a lot more compassion. Well, I think a lot of parents don't really realize that that might be something they go through someday. And I, I think you brought a topic, you know, really f- kind of front and center where people are like, you know, maybe we should be paying attention to this as well. 
Yeah. I mean, I think that it was helpful when I, you know, in some ways anonymity, which is a big part of AA and Al-Anon, but in some ways the anonymity can keep people from seeking help that they need. And so I felt, and later on my son who supported my writing about this felt that it was important to get this information out to other families. I found when I was willing to talk in the beginning, you feel a lot of shame because of course, as a mother, even though you learn, you didn't cause it, you can't control it. You can't cure it. You feel as a mother that there's something that you've done to cause this. I mean, it's a normal reaction and you go out and, and, or as a father and, you know, as I began to talk about what, what was happening and no longer keep it a secret, I started to have people say, you know, my child is struggling with this, or I'm wondering about this. Um, and I, I, I thought that was really, really interesting. And it kind of emboldened me to be more honest about what's going on in my life. And at a certain point, I had to, because I was trying to juggle running a business, supporting our family, single mom. Um, and I just hit the wall at a certain point where I, I, I was like, I can't do this. I can't like come from hearing, you know, your son is going to die if he continues like this and then pop into work. Um, at the time, I was running a PR business um, that had been quite successful to, to support us. Um, and, and it became much more difficult. And then the recession also happened. So, um, you know, I, I ultimately took a, had to take a couple months off um, because, you know, I, I just my life was so dark at that point. I can only imagine how difficult that must have been. You know, and it has me kind of thinking, I mean, there's several themes that go throughout your book. What is something that you want the readers to take away? That's a great question. I I think that I really want people to be able to read it and not just, I mean, feel a connection, but also realize that you don't, you have more strength than you realize. Um, you, I think that during times of, of trouble, it, it's not a cliche that you really have to reach in and find where is that resilient part of you and where does your strength come from and who were you at some point in your life where you really took on challenges and you survived. Um, and I think when people follow this story, which is a bit of a Mr. Toad's wild ride, um, it's, it's roller coaster that. Um, at the same time, they see that the narrator, which is me, um, is able to continue onwards and find strength and survive. And there's still joy and there's still humor in this book. Um, And I, I think that it is really important in the darkest of times to reach out, to tell people what's going on. Don't be in isolation. Read as much as you can about people who are experiencing similar things and try to find who your people are um, and just keep your eye on the prize. I think connection is really important. I heard a quote and I, I'm not sure that I'm going to remember who the person is um, who said the quote, but it had to do with, um, I think it's Johan Hari who wrote chasing the scream and I believe there's a quote in there the opposite of addiction isn't sobriety it's connection I think the connection is essential um, it's important for us to stay connected to to other people who who love us and support us it's important for us to stay connected to our children it's key um, and so I just would like people to 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 read it and feel like hey I can survive I can walk off a burning boat, do something that I want more than anything, have a child, support that child, and I can survive probably the most difficult thing that a a parent will ever face, their their child's mortality. Of course, we all want to outlive our children. Um, Now, I'll be honest, if my son had died, and I've met many parents who that's happened to, I don't know what I would be saying to you. I, I, I can't tie it up in a neat bow and say, you know, if, if my son were to not have lived through this, I'd be fine because I, I, I'm not sure that I would be. I'm pretty sure that I wouldn't be. Yeah. I mean, that's just a difficult journey no matter what. And I'm glad that you, both you and your son were able to come out the other side of that and yes. are moving forward. And my goodness, I mean, your book really is a honest and 
just an eye-opening accounting. I think a lot of people, you know, like you were saying when we started this conversation, it's a book that people really wish that they had so they, they can read because it's, it's something that's real. You know, families are going through this and they, they can really go, you know what, I can relate to this, to this book. I can relate to this information. That's what I hope will happen. That's as, as my people say, from your lips to someone's ears. <laughs> um, that that's the intent of this book, and I'm, I'm it just came out uh, in July, mid July, and I'm really hoping to get it in the hands of people who are dealing with any number of these issues, and also for people to see their families, because um, many times you you know, you have a piece of it, like you might have a story about a family and addiction, but that, you know, it's a white uh, intact family, you know, you you don't necessarily see um, families that are very diverse, um, that are not more the more traditional family. Um, And how do you handle that? I mean, how do you deal with this as a single parent? Yeah. So Carla, where can our listeners connect with you and learn more about your book? Yes, um, I have a website, and it's my name, Carla, C-A-R-L-A, Samith, S-A-M-E-T-H, dot com, and I, um, they can find out more about the book there. Um, there's also links to ordering the book um, on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, IndieBound, or check with your favorite local independent bookseller, and if they don't have it, ask them to order it. Okay. Well, Carla, thank you so much for taking the time to be on the show with us here today. It's been such a pleasure. Thank you so much, Marianne. Well, thank you, Carla. It's been such an honor to spend this time with you. And of course, to talk about your new book, One Day on the Gold Line. Well, we're at the end of our time today. I would like to thank everyone for tuning in. You're listening to Moments with Marianne. And remember, make every moment count. In a single moment, your life can change. Moments with Marianne is a transformative hour that covers an endless array of topics with the best of the best. Her guests are leaders in their fields, ranging from inspirational authors, top industry leaders, and business and spiritual entrepreneurs. Each guest is gifted and a true visionary, a recognized leader in her own work. And while teaching others to develop, refocus, and grow, Marianne will bring the best guest and sometimes a special surprise. Don't miss this. You never know just which moment will change your life forever. Moments with Mary Ann airs every Sunday, Monday, Thursday, and Friday at 8 p.m. Eastern and 5 p.m. Pacific Time. Make sure to tune in and visit momentswithmaryann.com for more information.